Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Christy Lowry, an audiologist with Starkey Hear Care. I want to thank you all very much for joining myself and our oral rehabilitation specialist, Dr. Lauren Foley, as we discuss some communication strategies that we go over with our patients on a daily basis to help supplement the help that hearing aids give them. These communication strategies can be used by everyone, hearing loss or not, to have a more effective and less frustrating conversation. This webinar will last about 20 minutes and there will be a chance to ask questions following the presentation. If you have any questions, you can type them in the con comment box on the side and we'll make sure to answer them. So why do I need communication strategies when I wear hearing aids? We get this question a lot. And hearing aids are the most effective treatment for many types of hearing loss. However, unlike eyeglasses, which correct vision, hearing aids aid, they help. They are not able to correct the issue that is causing the loss in the first place. And because of that, and depending on the level of difficulty you have with understanding, using communication strategies can help supplement what the hearing aid is doing. You need to be able to use all of the tools you can in order to hear your very best. So what are some strategies for those with hearing loss? Well, facing or looking at the person you are talking to is always a good idea. Not only is it good to do that in general, but specifically with hearing loss, using your vision to help put the pieces together will help significantly. Most of us rely on visual cues during conversation and those with hearing loss even more so, whether you realize it or not. Our vision is a very powerful tool that we need to use. The huh or what becomes habit. So we need to not just say huh or what. Sometimes those may came, come out of your mouth immediately only to realize that you actually heard and understood what was said. So instead of that habit, if you could encourage um, yourself to create the habit of confirming what you did hear and asking for clarification for the rest. For example, I heard that you wanted to go out to dinner tonight, but didn't understand where you said. And then you need to be your own advocate. You must um, clarify for yourself. Don't just smile and nod because it's easier than asking for clarification. Going back to using huh or what, when we say one of those words, it's very likely going to be met by someone repeating the same phrase that you didn't understand in the first place because they're gonna say it the same exact way they did the first time. That won't really increase your chance of understanding it the second time around. Instead, you can ask them to speak more slowly. You all know that louder isn't always better, but slower absolutely is. You can ask them to rephrase what they said. For example, if my daughter says to me, mom, is it okay if I go to the neighbor's house to play and I don't understand? If she then says, Mom, Ava asked if I could come play, is that okay? I can put enough together from both of those sentences to understand what she's asking me. So some strategies um, that we discussed uh, previously were ones that you can use out and in a social situation. It's not awkward to ask somebody to re-say what they're saying instead of using huh or what. It is not awkward to make sure that you're looking at the person that you're talking to if you don't know them. But there are some strategies that we can coach our family and friends and those closest to us on so that they're using it consistently to help us to understand better. So one is to get a partner's attention. So have them say your name prior to talking to you. Everybody hears their name out of a crowd. We're all conditioned to do that. So if somebody says your name, they then have your attention prior to saying something and you're gonna be able to understand them a lot better than if they just are talking and you come in halfway through realizing that they're talking to you. And then speaking face to face, not from another room or from behind someone, this is certainly going to improve your ability to understand. Speaking slowly and clearly. Again, I mentioned a moment ago, and, and something you realize is that louder isn't always better. The television, our patients tell us quite often, you know, I turn up the TV, but that just makes the background noise and all that music louder too, and I'm, I'm still struggling to hear and understand it. So louder doesn't make you hear more clearly. 
slowly does. And that's something that you can coach your friends and family on. They don't need to scream. They just need to make sure they're looking at you, getting your attention and speaking at a slower rate so that you have a chance to understand what they're saying. And this rephrasing instead of repeating, again, it's very, very important to have them rephrase rather than repeat. And if they can get into the habit of doing that, it takes that frustration off of you that you don't have to ask for it every time. Announcing a topic change is another really uh, great thing to have your friends and family get used to doing around you. Because we use context as a tool to help us fill in the blanks and understand, knowing you've changed topics from the grocery store list to boarding the dogs for your upcoming trip is gonna allow for you to use context to your full advantage. Creating a better listening environment is another thing that you have some control over. And I think it's very important to realize that you need to control the controllable in these situations. You can't control the fact that you have hearing loss, but there are many things that you can do to give yourself a better chance at hearing. The first, of course, is wearing your prescribed hearing aids consistently. But you want to do everything you can to improve the environment that you're in. Wearing your hearing aids all day, every day is the first step towards that. So I often use the analogy of going to the gym. You know, imagine if you were a member of a gym and you went, let's say, twice a month. Well, that is certainly better than not going at all. But you'll likely be sore the following days because your body isn't really used to it. Imagine if you went to the gym every day you're gonna be in so much better shape. Wearing your hearing aids consistently is like going to the gym consistently. The more you use them, the more your brain is stimulated, the more benefit that you'll get from them. Good lighting is another thing that uh, you have some control over, especially in your own home environment. If you can't see the person well that you're talking to, you won't be able to use any of those visual cues that we spoke about earlier. Minimizing distractions that you can. If you're having an important conversation, mute the television. If you're in the car, turn down the radio when you're having that conversation. Walk away from crowds in order to listen. You can close the doors and windows to minimize background noise. You know, don't sit right next to the dishwasher or the fan when trying to have a conversation. And don't do this while doing the dishes or really any tasks that you're concentrating on. You know, one, you can't really look at the person when you're looking down, concentrating on a task. You're often not facing that person either, and that sound is not traveling towards you, but away from you. Not to mention, in this dishes scenario, the water is running, so that's going to make it even more difficult to hear over what's going on in front of you and, and really attend to that conversation. So there are some things that you can do within a room um, or choose in an environment that you go to that can help you. So identifying rooms and environments that are more conducive to understanding is an important thing that you can control. For example, shopping centers or restaurants with a lot of high ceilings, windows, and hard services, it's gonna be a lot difficult uh, a lot more difficult to hear in those environments and make the job of listening and carrying on conversation more difficult. Compared to a place with lower ceilings, carpeting and soft surfaces. If you want to enjoy a mealtime conversation, choose a restaurant that you know it will be easier to listen in. At home, if conversation is difficult in your living room, look around. Can you add an area rug, any curtains or pillows? These types of things actually can really help you. So now that we've discussed some strategies and things to be aware of in your environments and can be helpful to, to listen and understand, Dr. Foley is gonna go through some real life scenarios. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. So Dr. Lowry, reviewed with everyone really good situations that you can see yourself in when you have a hearing loss and all the changes that you can make to be a better communicator or changes your friends and family can make. So let's go ahead and take a look at these scenarios you find yourself on a day in day out basis and use those skills. 
Okay, let's take a look at this picture. We can see that uh, this woman doing the dishes is not too happy right now. It looks like her husband is in the other room watching TV and they're having some poor communication. So how can this situation be improved? The first thing that we wanna do is get the other person's attention first. So as Dr. Lowry mentioned, we are trained to hear our names, even in a crowd of people. So if we can say the other person's name or even walk over to them physically, we're going to be able to engage in better conversation after that. Being face-to-face, -face, if possible, is so important. Make sure that you walk from the kitchen to the living room or the living room to the kitchen if we really need to say something important. And of course, minimize those distractions. In this scenario, we can either turn off the faucet and stop doing the dishes, or we can turn off or mute the television to make sure we can really concentrate on each other. There we go, reducing background noises. Those dishes are, are the bane of most people's existence when there's hearing loss in the house. Okay, so in this scenario that we see, we have a group of friends going out to eat together. So what kind of strategies could these people use to have a better conversation, even though they're in this big group? Speaking one at a time, this takes some getting used to. Oftentimes in groups, we all have something exciting we wanna say, but really it's most important when there's someone with hearing loss present that we speak one at a time. So that way the person with hearing loss can focus on what's being said and not get distracted by other speakers. Look at who's speaking. So back to that face-to-face -face thing, you know, we're really homing in on being face-to-face -face because it's so important. If someone at the other end of the table is speaking, take the time and effort to turn and look at them. And everyone at that table should be speaking slowly and clearly. If we're going too fast, it's going to be hard for the person with hearing loss to keep up with the conversation. Announcing topic changes, like we said, especially when there's such a big group of people and everyone has something to say. If you go from talking about your work day and then you wanna to switch topics to talking about your weekend plans, we have to let people know we're making that switch so it's easier to process and follow along. Stop conversation when wait staff is present. This would be really important because we want to make sure that the person with hearing loss is able to hear and communicate with the wait staff. You know, if they're telling about daily specials or asking if people want refills, we want everyone to be able to hear that. So pausing the conversation at that point is going to be really beneficial. Consider going at off peak hours. I mean, in a group like this, you can't always make that decision. That's a lot of people where you need to work the schedules out together. But if you're going at prime time, dinner at a restaurant, Friday night, 7 p.m., it's going to be very busy and there's much more background noise. Going a little earlier or a little later means there's gonna be less people there and it's gonna be easier to hear in that scenario. And then ask to be seated away from noise. Again, that's not something we can always control, but it could be beneficial if possible. Being able to choose tables away from the bathrooms or away from the kitchens, and that's easier to do if you go at off peak hours. So definitely something to consider. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about phone conversations. So we can see here that this woman looks pretty frustrated on the phone. She doesn't know what's being said. So when you can't be face to face with someone and you're on the phone, what are our options for communicating better? Make sure the room is quiet. So if you're sitting in say the living room and the television is on and you have maybe grandkids playing you know, with noisy toys and you're trying to have a phone conversation, that's going to be very difficult because there's so many distracting sounds. So making sure that you can move into a quiet room so you can focus just on that phone call will be very helpful. Ask them to speak slowly. So again, as Dr. Lowry really made a great point of earlier, it's not about them necessarily speaking louder, but about slowing down. If you can't see their facial expressions, it's important that they enunciate and speak lowly, slowly so that you can pick up on each word that's said. 
And back to don't just ask, huh, or what. It really is such a habit. And it gets to be very frustrating for you with the hearing loss, as well as your friends and family members. They get tired of repeating themselves and you get tired of misunderstanding. So if you're talking to someone on the phone and they say, um, I'm going to the store and you misunderstand that, you're not sure what they said, don't say huh or what and prompt them to repeat it. You know, ask them to rephrase. So that way they can say, I'm driving over to Kroger. And that gives you a better chance of understanding what was said. Consider a closed caption phone. Um, oftentimes we have people nowadays who maybe don't even have a home phone and only use a cell phone. But if it's an option, there are some really high quality caption home phones that are available nowadays. And it's really great, again, when we can't see someone's face and we can't see their lips moving, to be able to still find a way to use our vision. So if you can listen on the phone to the conversation and then follow along reading the conversation on a screen, that's a great option. And if you're interested in getting one of those, I certainly recommend asking an audiologist because they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Okay, so effective communication in a meeting. So what are the things that are going to be important when we're in this work setting or a group setting? Um, you'll notice once we pull up some of these options that they're going to be similar to what we talked about earlier. But one of the things that's important nowadays is making sure that you're in an enclosed room. A lot of the working spaces nowadays are more open than they used to be because they're trying to give a sense of community and togetherness within the work area. But if you're in a office that has maybe only partial walls um, or the ceiling is open to other areas, that is going to cause some interference with other sounds, other people talking. So making sure that you're in an enclosed room for a meeting, that's going to help with communication. Sitting in a circular formation. Um, you know, sometimes people, when they go to meetings, there's just one long rectang rectangular table that everyone sits at and you can't see everyone's face. So for someone who has hearing loss, that can be very difficult. So in this picture, like you see here, if we can sit in a circular formation, it means the person with hearing loss will be able to use facial expressions a whole lot easier and be able to turn and face whoever is speaking. Speak one at a time, clearly and slowly. I hope you guys are really focusing on this one. We need to make sure that when people have hearing loss that they're speaking slowly and clearly and also using visuals when possible. So in a meeting, you know, if we can have photographs or even a graph of changes within a company, those visuals are going to be very important to help make sure everyone can follow along. And this last point here, a lot of people don't think about this, but fatigue really affects our ability to listen. We see lots of people who come in and they say, you know, I feel like my hearing gets worse at the end of the day. And it's not that the hearing is fluctuating throughout the day. It's just that by the end of the day, you're tired. You've put in a full day work, full day effort. You know, you've been through a lot already. And so when we're tired, it's just harder to concentrate. So making sure that we schedule meetings uh, in the morning or when everyone feels most awake, that can be very beneficial. Okay, how about this one, being in the car? Um, we know for a lot of our patients with hearing loss that being in the car poses um, some extra struggle because you cannot be face-to-face. -face. Someone's gotta be looking at the road where you're driving and paying attention. Um, the other thing too is the road has extra noise, you know, um, tires against the road, that, that's gonna cause some humming, it's gonna be some extra noise. So what can we do to make conversation in the car better? Surprise, surprise, speak slowly and clearly. If we're speaking too fast, we're gonna have trouble hearing over that road noise. Rephrase, don't repeat. I really want us to focus on this. These can be tools that we use in our day-to-day -day world. And it's not just the person with hearing loss that needs to know this. It's something we need to share with friends and family as well. Don't look out the window. So the person who's driving, please look out the windshield. That's going to be very important. 
Um, but the person who's not, the person in the passenger seat, you know, don't turn and look out the side window away from the person who needs to hear you the most. We know that people hear best when the sound source comes directly from the mouth and hits the ear. So if you're not driving, definitely turn to look at the other person. Um, so that way we can maintain safety and also have better communication. Okay, so reducing distractions. The AC and the heat, yes, we need to have those in the summer and the winter, absolutely, but we can reduce the fan level. So if they're up on four and they're really blasting, that gives too much distraction. Those sounds can overpower speech sometimes. So we wanna make sure that we turn the levels of the AC and heat down so the fan isn't so loud. Close windows for the same reason, that wind noise is going to cause an issue or a barrier in communication and turn off the radio. You don't have to leave it off the whole time. People really enjoy listening to music or talk shows when they drive, but if you're going to have an important conversation or if you guys are really looking to follow directions specifically, let's turn off that radio so we can concentrate better. Okay, so this is just going to be some scenarios for you guys to look at and decide which is going to be a better scenario. So which is better for having a phone call? In A, we can see the woman on the phone. We have her pointed out with an arrow. She's in a living environment with three children, uh, two of which on an iPad, one is watching television, and she's trying to have a phone conversation. In scenario B, we have a woman who is on the couch in her living area by herself, and it doesn't look like there's as many distractions. So when you look at these two hops, two options, I hope that everyone recognizes that option B is going to be more ideal for having a good phone call. Okay, which is better for eating out? Now, I know a lot of us aren't doing that right now, um, but eventually we will get back to enjoying restaurants. So scenario A, we have a restaurant where the tables are separated by booths, and then we also have carpet on the flooring. In scenario B, we have lots of tables in the restaurant. We have a lot of glass windows along the walls and tile floor. So when I look at scenario B, the first thing that comes to mind is echo and reverberation. So sound is gonna be bouncing around in that restaurant, which is going to make it more difficult for having a conversation, especially someone with hearing loss. So I would prefer if you had to pick one of these two restaurants, that you would pick option A. With the booth seating, the conversation can be kept more intimate and that carpeted flooring is going to mean that there's less sound bouncing around the room. Okay, we just talked about meetings, so let's see what we can remember about this. When we want a good situation for a meeting, let's see, we've got option A here. So what that looks like to me is lots of hard surfaces. Again, we've got wood flooring, we've got brick walls. And if you notice that glass wall does not go all the way up to the ceiling. So we could get some extra noise coming in from other people on the other side. There is option B. Okay, that looks a little better, right? Um, it's in an enclosed room, but that table looks very long and narrow. And I'm just not sure if I could see someone all the way at the other end of it. And then what about option C? We've got carpeting on the floors, the table's smaller, it's an isolated room, and everyone is in a circular formation. That's the meeting room I would want us to pick, so that way we can use visual cues and keep the sound more enclosed. Okay, which is better for conversations at home? So again, right now, most of us are spending more time at home than we are going out. So this one's important. If we look at option A, we see a living area. Um, there's some curtains on the windows. You've got some nice plush furniture with pillows, and then we have some carpeting on the floor. If we look at option B, this is a beautiful kitchen. I certainly wish mine looked like that. Um, and while it's lovely, and I know a lot of families like to gather in the kitchen and cook together, it has a very high cathedral ceiling, lots of hard surfaces with the wood floor, 
with the granite countertops, all of the wood cabinetry. And so if we're in that kitchen, again, I just really think there's gonna be a lot of echoing of sound because of the hard surfaces. And if anyone is actually cooking and doing the dishes, that's gonna add extra noise. So when you're at home, if you wanna have an important conversation and make sure everyone is able to understand, pick scenario A, the cushy living room, because that's gonna make it easier. Okay, which room is better for watching TV? I mean, a lot of us enjoy our movies and our television shows, so which room should we watch TV in? We have room A, um, which looks beautiful. It's light and airy, but oh, it's got that cathedral ceiling again. Um, and that television looks like it's pretty far away from the couch and we have some beautiful wood floors. So I think you all know what I'm thinking, a little bit of echo in that scenario. And then how about option B? Okay, definitely a lower ceiling. The room is smaller altogether, so the couch and TV are a lot closer and we have a rug down on the floor. That more intimate setting is going to allow for easier sound transmission from the TV to the listener. So if you have the choice, choose B. This is the most important thing. Dr. Lowry mentioned it earlier and I really want us to focus on it. Be your own advocate. If you are the one with hearing loss, you are the one who knows what you need. Uh, people cannot look at you and know you have a hearing loss. They can't look at you and know that you have trouble with communication. You have to be the one to let people know you need assistance. Tell them to speak more slowly. Ask them to rephrase. Let them know to get your attention before they start talking. Make sure that you stand up for yourself and help educate other people on the best ways to communicate with someone who has a hearing loss. All right, guys, that's all for our presentation so far, but we certainly are going to welcome any questions that you might have. Um, so as Dr. Lowry mentioned, feel free to write them in the question section and we'll make sure to get them all answered. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Laura, can we get those read out? Okay, so it looks like our questions right now from Mary Ann, that they relate to tinnitus, tinnitus and hearing loss, and what can someone do that has tinnitus? That's a really great question. Um, so tinnitus, while it cannot really affect your ability to communicate, it can be very distracting, and for some people, it can be annoying. So tinnitus, for those of you who don't know or haven't experienced, are sounds that we hear within our head. Um, a lot of times they can be ringing sounds, they can be buzzing sounds, or even ocean waves. So when someone has that type of a sound, the number one step is to have your hearing tested. Oftentimes when we have tinnitus or ringing in the ears, there's some form of damage at the ear level, and that could also present as a hearing loss. Uh, the number one treatment for tinnitus is treating that hearing loss. So hearing aids can be really helpful so we recommend that first step of getting your hearing tested and then letting the hearing professional guide you in the best way to get treatment. Hey, Lauren and Christy, um, I have another question here. Sure. Uh, any suggestions on how to get the person with the hearing loss to recognize it? That's another great question. Um, it can be very difficult because it's a very personal thing. And the, the difficulty is we often notice that someone has hearing loss before they do, someone in our lives, because no, we're noticing that they're turning the television up or that they are asking for repetition or answering our questions that we didn't ask necessarily. And so I would suggest being very gentle in this suggestion and make it a very, um, a situation 
to, to make sure that they understand that you're not going to push them into doing something that they don't want to do, they can get a hearing test and not do anything with that if they're not ready to. So you could suggest that you could go in together and perhaps get a baseline hearing test that both of you could have. And of course, the professional will probably find a hearing loss if you're suspicious that that person has something going on, counsel on what's going on with them, make possibly make a recommendation to treat, but ultimately it's their decision. And so in that way, it can be very uh, non-threatening and you can treat it as just a, a, like almost like a physical, knowing exactly what's going on with your body is a great way uh, to be preventative in your healthcare, which we all know is the best approach to healthcare. And so by suggesting they just get a test and leave it at that, then you know, you're not suggesting that they, they get hearing aids. So don't lead with, hey, I think you need hearing aids. Lead with, hey, you know, I think it'd be a good idea if, if we got a hearing test together, or you got a hearing test, or you'll know best how to approach that with, you know, whatever relationship you have with that person. Um, but that way, you know, they know that it's completely within their control and their decision to follow up. And once they have the information in front of them, then, you know, they can start uh, relating what the professional said about their hearing loss in everyday life, realizing that they're turning the television up to compensate, et cetera. So it just starts that conversation. Perfect. Thanks, Christy. Uh, I do have another question here. How do you communicate with someone wearing a face mask if you can't see their facial expression or lip movement? That certainly does make things very challenging and we're all dealing with that these days. Um, we actually did a webinar several weeks ago now on this very topic. And so, um, you know, some of the things that we talked about today can be very helpful. Knowing what the topic is, is going to be very, very helpful. Um, you know, when you're checking out at the grocery store, uh, you know that the clerk is probably going to be asking you something about, you know, what's in this bag that I can't see? Is this parsley or cilantro? Um, you'll have some context there, but relying heavily on context. If you're in a situation where you can socially distance enough, where it's okay to, to pull the mask down, safely and if you feel comfortable doing that in order to watch uh, facial uh, cues and expressions that certainly will be helpful as well. It's not always possible to do that in today's environment. Um, so again, using some of the things that we said today can be very helpful asking them to rephrase rather than repeat. Um, talk more slowly, that may help as well. And so you can combine all of those things and, and do your best. That's all we can do these days. Are there any other questions? Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today. You'll all be receiving a follow up email and if you have any questions um, or suggestions for future webinars, uh, you'll have the opportunity to take a survey and let us know how we're doing and if there's anything in particular that you'd like to hear about in the future. Um, again, thank you for your time this afternoon.